welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Entertainment Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am, as always, delighted to be with you on another Tuesday for another author interview. As we get started, I do want to remind you to like, subscribe, follow on whatever platform you are either listening to or watching this episode on. That really helps the algorithm, gets the podcast out to more readers such as yourselves. If you would like to support the podcast in another way, you can go to GSMC podcast.info. There you can leave a tip or a donation. Uh, another way to help the podcast, get the podcast out to more people, help us create more content, etc. If you, while you're there, you want to leave a question, I'm happy to engage with questions or comments uh, at the beginning of the episode after I receive those questions or comments. So again, if you want to help the channel and the entire podcast network in a monetary fashion, you can do so by going to gsmcpodcast.info. As always, thank you for every bit of support that you've given this podcast over the years. Whatever form that support has come in, it is greatly appreciated. So how is your week? It is mid-October, smack in the middle of October the 15th. So we are right in the middle. It's um, been an okay week, okay weekend. We, everyone we know, not everyone we know, but uh, our friends went back to the UK on Friday. Uh, our other friends went back to Germany on Saturday. Another friend of mine left for the U.S. for a couple of months on Sunday, so it was just boom, 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 people leaving all weekend. Uh, so everyone's great, good flights, got to where they were going safely, so we're grateful for that. But uh, yeah, lots of lots of leaving over the weekend, and um, we had a, a quiet weekend. It's, it's finally started to rain, so you get a rainy season here and a not rainy season here, and the not rainy season lasts six months. I mean, we got a couple of little tiny drizzly rain that didn't even that barely got the ground wet over the summer but not it's not much and so now it's finally starting to rain but i've been laughing because um new growth is great I, i've been uh, appreciating the new growth in my hair but new growth and humidity just gives me <laughs> uh i i wish it would stay a little curlier once it actually grows out but um i just get these like crazy curly whatever you want to call those when it, it is humid so it's it's fun uh some days it's really really crazy we uh were walking this morning we ran a couple of errands and it rained really hard while we were at the grocery store so we just stayed and waited for the rain to pass and then it rained a little bit also on the way home but I realized on the way home that I need new shoes because uh, my socks were soaked when we, but I, I have two spots, one in each shoe that were just letting in puddles of water and I was squelching on the way home. So that's on my list of things to accomplish. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, the weather, my shoes, all terribly exciting things happening <laughs> in our world. So I hope you had something more interesting than squelchy shoes over the weekend. <laughs> Let's talk about the book that we are here to talk about. Uh, as I mentioned at the end of last week's episode, uh, this week I'm speaking with Morgan Middleton about the first book in a new series, a graphic novel. It's called Asteria, The Legend of the Fallen Star. The author is Morgan Middleton. Let me go ahead and give you the description of the book. Again, it is the first book in a series. 14-year-old uh, Celeste Evans has perfected the art of camouflage, inspired in, in part by her life on an army base, but mostly by her shyness. She prefers to slip under the radar, but when she is plucked from her ordinary suburban life and placed into a galactic military boarding school, Celeste must squash her own insecurities and find her true purpose. Does she have the strength to hone her powers to fight, the preservation, fight for the preservation of all galaxies, or will time run out for those she loves and for countless others? And again, that is the description of Asteria, the Legend of the Fallen Star. It is, as I said a couple of times, the first in a new series. I am excited to see what happens with um, Celeste because we do just, we, we just get a little bit of her story. We, at the beginning, you get some of the backstory of the the world that Morgan is building, and that world is, involves uh, galaxies and planets and all kinds of things. There, uh, There's conflict. And then we meet Celeste at 14, and she has no knowledge of this world. She is living uh, on a military base, and she just 
thinks everything is, you know, she's a normal 14 year old kid until her mom says she's gotten into the same private school that she, her mom went to and takes her to the school. Um, Celeste falls asleep on the way there and they end up not only at a new school, but on a completely different planet. <laughs> and so, uh, before, of course, you know, these, the, the, the way these things always happen in books of this sort, before Celeste can really get the backstory, she is thrown into her first test and, and just has to figure things out. She, you know, sink or swim. So I'm looking forward to seeing where, what direction things are going to go. She's of course going to discover what she has that can be a benefit. And, you know, it's kind of one of the heroes, the hero's journey story where she's going to have to figure things out. And the, uh, it's a graphic novel. So you get a lot of the story through the images, which is, I think, always a unique um, challenge, but also kind of a fun thing for a reader. Instead of getting backstory and, and current story in words, you're getting them in images and the images are really well done. I, I appreciated the artwork. I like the artwork. Morgan's going to talk about that process of the artwork a little bit in the interview. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm excited to learn more about this world and learn more about Celeste. And I will say one quick thing about Celeste's name. So living in Portugal, trying to learn Portuguese, we do have a, a neighbor whose name is Celeste, but in Portuguese, it's pronounced Celeste. So I've gotten very, you know, I'm very conscious about making sure that I pronounce her name correctly. And so if at any time I say Celeste, it's not because I have some kind of a strange lisp happening. It's just because my brain has reprogrammed itself to say Celeste instead of Celeste. And that's the way I read it when I, when I read the book, but just a side note. So let's go ahead and let Morgan talk about this first book in the series. Again, the book is Asteria, The Legend of the Fallen Star. The author is Morgan Middleton. Hi, Morgan, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for uh, welcoming, welcoming me here. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. I'm excited to talk about it's the first graphic novel in a series. Um, before we get to the, the graphic novel itself, though, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about yourself so my viewers can get to know you a little bit. Sure. Well, okay. My name is Morgan Middleton, and I am actually a former opera singer. Um, I grew up in Virginia and um, did my undergrad in LA and did my master's in Boston. And um, I, you know, was singing opera at the time. That was my passion. That was my love. And, you know, opera is all very like, dr it's dramatic, it's story-based. Um, it kind of in, uh, it kind of uses all of the art forms of, you know, like writing and, and acting and singing and dancing and everything like that. So it was something that I have always felt like I needed to kind of push the envelope on. And so um, every year, every, every time I graduate, I try to one up myself. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I got into writing, which is, mm -hmm. it sounds very, very weird. Opera to writing. Like, how did, how did you do that? How did you get there? Um, but um, my first instance was for every year we have to do a recital. And um, I decided that at the end of my recital, I wanted to um, do something different. So I ended up doing a um, a five piece chamber orchestra orchestral piece. Um, so I did that, and I was like, "Wow, I really loved that. How do I one up that for my masters?" Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where writing got involved. And I I ended up writing my first. Um, one woman story called remember when and it was like a one woman musical and after that i was like wow i really really like this i really like telling my perspective differently incorporating music incorporating drama incorporating different characters into things and um that's kind of how i found myself to where i am right now currently um i work at a um real estate investment company and their marketing team and then on the side, I have my own media arts company called Morganacity, which is kind of where all of my artistic endeavors lie. So like Asteria um, and some other short films that I've been doing. So that's kind of how, long story short, I got to where I am right now. 
It's not that big of a leap. You went from opera to uh, Asteria. It could be classified as a space opera, you know, depending on on the the scale of it. So it, there you go. I mean, it could, it could, it definitely could. So it could, depending on wh what direction it takes. <laughs> um, but it is that. a graphic novel. It's called Asteria, the Legend of the Fallen Star. This is the first installment. So can you yes. give an overview of that story? Sure. So Asteria, the Legend of the Fallen Star follows Celeste Evans. She's 14 years old. Um, she's kind of like a military army brat. And she, you know, she's very shy. She has two younger siblings that kind of take the show, steal the show away from her. And she's just not really sure where she wants to be, what she wants to do. And it's not until her mom takes her to a galactic boarding school does she then have to step up and step outside of herself and find her own purpose. So it's all about her journey, her journey with her friends, her journey, finding herself, finding her voice. And you say that so casually, her mom takes her to a galactic boarding school. Celeste has absolutely no idea there's anything unusual about her family until she just ends up. She has no clue. She has no clue. <laughs> but that's kind of what's fun about it because it's like, okay, you don't really know who you are on earth and then you're moved into this different environment and yeah. you definitely don't know who you are then and it's kind of like exploring that journey with her yeah what was your initial inspiration for celeste's story actually i based celeste off of my mom she did not go to galactic boarding school <laughs> but uh <laughs> darn um <laughs> but <laughs> but my mom grew up on military bases and She's also very, very shy and kind of all throughout my, my life, I was like, oh, I wish my mom could see herself the way that I see her. And when I was was challenged to make Asteria, um, I kind of gravitated towards the story of my mom and how I wish she could see herself, how I wish that through all the trials that she's gone through, she could have, she could have had something like this as like a way to show her strength mm. and that she could see her own strength um, emulated. And it's kind of actually really beautiful because now that she's gotten to, you know, read the book, I've told her a little bit more about, about like my plans for all the characters and everything like that. The storyline, the way that it's changed her has been so fascinating because it's like seeing a mirror and actually realizing like, hey, like I I could I could do this all along. Like I have this strength, I have this power. And um that that's what makes me excited to make sure that everyone else sees that. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I like that your mom has, has seen it and that you 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 told her the inspiration behind it. That that's nice. I do really love that. Uh, her mom was the inspiration um, for Celeste and for some of the story. And I love uh, that her mom has gotten to see it and hear Morgan's take on it and why she was the inspiration. I think that's very special and very sweet. And I just, yeah, I like it. So we are going to take our first break of this episode. When we come back, we'll be talking more about Celeste as the main character. You're tuned in to the GSMC Book Review podcast, and I will be right back. Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Yeah, damn, ain't that great? I don't wanna go to work, cause my boss is a jerk, and I'm not even that pay. I need a change in my life, cause I don't feel alive, and there's nothing that makes me happy. Oh. Hold my beer for a minute I'm about to quit my job Cash in for a ticket I'm going on a trip And I don't plan to visit I'm gonna stay there Till I feel like I'm winning all And this is just the beginning I need a big change Help me feel like living I need a big swing Home runs I'm hitting And I'll never look back Moving on till I get it all And we all got dreams We all want things But what you gonna do for it? How you gonna move for it? What you gonna be? And do you believe
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with author Morgan Middleton about the first in her graphic novel series, Asteria, The Legend of the Fallen Star. Let's go ahead and return to that interview. What about Celeste as a character do you think is going to resonate with readers? I think that... I think that Celeste is such a a personable character and it's someone that you know is not really sure I also I liked to think that I was very sure as a teenager what I was doing and it kind of wasn't until adulthood that I was like oh my gosh I have I have absolutely no clue I wish that I had something that could be very real with me um in how this world works um in some in some instances and so i think that for people that are seeing celeste i think that they'll see a lot of you know they will connect with that aspect like they'll connect with the fact that like she doesn't have it all together she doesn't know everything and and she's really trying she's trying to put herself out there i think everyone at one point has tried to put themselves out there um but kind of felt like a fish out of water mm -hmm. um I also think that there's a lot of side characters as well that kind of fill in the parts that maybe people don't feel like they can connect with Celeste as well. There's a lot of um, other characters. She has like her whole gang with her, um, basically. And um, I mean, if one character doesn't fit for someone, hopefully another would. But I overall, I think that Celeste finding herself um mentally uh physically everything like that um i think that people could connect with did you grow up reading graphic novels or i mean what why did you decide to write the story as a graphic novel as opposed to um you know a regular novel or some other medium um so this hadn't always started off as a graphic novel actually it was more of a challenge to me. Mm -hmm. Someone had given me the challenge. This was like a COVID project. Mm -hmm. um, and I really started writing a lot more during COVID. And someone told me like, hey, like, I know you're very opinionated. What kind of cartoon show would you want to see in the world? And like, can you make it? I'm like, mm -hmm. that's a really good question. I grew up on cartoons. I really loved uh, Totally Spies. I loved Wings. I loved Sailor Moon, anything transformational, magical, um, kind of like an ensemble cast, really. And I was like, okay, let me let me think about this. Let me let me think on this. And like within like two or three days, I had already kind of like outlined everything that I wanted Asteria, I didn't know that it was going to be called Asteria at the time, but everything I wanted the project to be. And then I was like, wait a second. I feel like this reads more like a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. I feel like I I want to I want to see, I want to feel the characters. I want them to be alive and present in the world. But coming from a background as an opera singer, I'm like, I don't know anything about writing a graphic novel. Yeah. I don't know the outline. I don't know how I'm supposed to, you know, the format of this medium. Um, and at that time, I hadn't really done much film, so I didn't really know the film medium either. So I was just kind of like, okay, well, I have hours to kill. Let me go read and watch and, like, look up different formats, how you need to format everything, what I need to provide to artists, like uh to do like line drawings and things like that I had no clue so I had to look all that information up and by the time I finished I was like oh my goodness okay <laughs> well <laughs> let's so start small I had a whole my wall was just like replaced with sticky notes mm -hmm. it was just all sticky notes and I was like okay I feel like I'm going to write the script out and then I need to block each page that I write by with 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 a, with a sort of, a sort of action with with characters. I had little stick figure drawings. I'm not a great artist like a artist. I'm, I can't draw mm -hmm. to save my life. 
but I can make stick figures. So I'm going to make, I'm going to stick figure this whole thing out. And then, you know what I read? It's really important to make sure that the reader wants to turn the page. So then it's like, okay, so I need to put my, I need to make a really great segue for someone to want to turn the page at the end. What, what panel should I put at the end? And then how do I get from that first panel to the end panel? And then make the reader want to flip. And so that was a whole different thing. And then I ended up drawing emotional arcs because I kind of had an idea of where I wanted, you know, when I when I formulated the, the concept, it was a television show. And I had each season kind of with uh, kind of laid out with the character evolution, you know, with each plot line. And then I kind of had an emotional arc as well and I'm like okay so how do I break this whole thing up into like a smaller segment for right. each book and still make it something that is interesting still make something that has like ebbs and flows in it but is not static because for a television show you have 12 20 episodes to mm -hmm. to get that emotional line through but yeah. and comic book you only have that one book to make someone want to go grab a second book um so I had to find a way to make that something that's interesting while also trying to build out this new world since you know it's not taking place here mm -hmm. um and still kind of solidify the character solidify the place so that in the next book you don't have to do all that groundwork and you can kind of just go with the plot um so that took that took a while that that was about like a month and a half and I was like oh my gosh if anyone walks into my room they're gonna think <laughs> that a crazy person lives here like those conspiracy uh, theory memes <laughs> yeah I was like I feel like that is this a problem <laughs> like, I had no clue it's so, logical yeah to me it all made sense and people were like okay I don't quite get what you're doing, but you just go do what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of how I conceptualized that first book. And then I had to do a lot of reading about what kind of artists it takes to make these books happen. Mm -hmm. Um as a performer I've kind of always been on the other side of the bench when it comes to like auditioning or to applying for things I'm the one that's sending my tapes in and then being judged and then you know getting the yes or the no right um and on this this time I was on the opposite side of the table I was giving the yes and the no's um and I was like okay as an artist on the from the other side what would I expect for my panel to do? How would I like to be treated? How would I like to get the information? How would I like to get paid? Everything like that. And, um, you know, I took it kind of as a big weight because it's like, sometimes you're in an audition space where you feel like, oh man, I like wasn't good enough. I, I didn't get this, but it's not that. I never want anyone to feel like that. Um, a lot of the times, like I have, you know, spreadsheets of different artists that I've come across that I've absolutely loved. Mm -hmm. Their style just wasn't what fit for this. Sure. Um, and so the auditioning process was a lot and it took a really long time. Plus, I had to figure out a budget for a book. Mm -hmm. Never thought about a book budget in my life. And yeah. I guess, you know, in ways of a novel versus a graphic novel is that if it was just a novel, I could have just written the whole thing, probably have gotten an editor to look through my stuff and been like, okay, change this, change that, things like that. But when it comes to a graphic novel, you also need the artist, you need the color, you need the flattener, like everything like that. Um, things need to be inked, type, like the text needs to be put in. So I was like, okay, how do I know if this is good, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like, how do I, how do I know I am getting a great end product? And so after 
weeks of what felt like stalking artists online <laughs> and then like trying to find great artists because also because it's the first book so it's like well right who's this girl what does she want from me um you know what's her budget like I, I'm I don't expect anyone to do anything for free right um and so it was okay does this person meet a budget I can work with and does their art speak to me and speak to the character um and so one of the first things that I did was um I I found one I you know kind of talked to a couple of people through just like online forums like you know like Facebook looked at people on Instagram looked at some people that are on Upwork and things like that Mm -hmm. um and I just a lot of them were just cold emails like hi my name is Morgan um I really was inspired by X and X drawing and I'm working on this book and I would love for you to do a character design of my main character um and kind of see if we click and then you know, hopefully we can like move on from there. Because though some people might do character drawings, it doesn't necessarily mean that they want to do an entire book. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and or a series. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so I was really fortunate to find uh, Brittany Osaseri, who did the first couple of character drawings in the book. And I was like, she gets it. She gets the look. She gets to feel she was able to capture because I had kind of sent her a huge PDF of, you know, kind of what the character goes through, her emotional state and things like that. And when I first saw her character drawing, I was like, she captured that emotion, which I feel like is very, very hard to capture in picture. Mm -hmm. um, and when it, especially when it's not an emotive scene, when it's just her face and her body. And I was like, she gets it. I love that. I need that. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I would love to work with you. Would you be interested in this? And at that time, that was her first book. And she was like, I would absolutely love to be a part of this. And I was like, great. Got that. <laughs> I need to now find a colorist. <laughs> because I was like, okay, well, this is kind of the timeline that I'm hoping for. She's like, that's a lot of work for just one person. And I'm like, you're right. I'm so sorry. Like, let me find someone that can, you know, match your style and match your energy and match your craft mm -hmm. and put it together. And so I, I also put out another call for, you know, someone to do all the inks and to do the lettering. And, um, there was a couple of people that really, really stood out that did like such a great job. And actually one I had brought on one person and then they got sick and they couldn't continue. Mm -hmm. So then I had to bring on another person, uh, Bruna Belfort. And it was just amazing. It, I couldn't have asked for a more seamless transition. Of course there were like other bumps in the road, sure. um, but at the end of the day, like, it felt like, okay, like, this was supposed to happen. So it was an all well, woman team. It was like, wow, okay. Like, that's great. I really, really love this. I love the fact that I get to support other female artists in their mm -hmm. own endeavors um, while also bringing this story to life. Yeah. I have to say, with all do impressed impressedness <laughs> I, I am very impressed morgan is not afraid of a learning curve absolutely not the, she jumps in with both feet she learns what needs to be learned i am very impressed by that so good good job morgan i am not quite that adventurous i don't think so uh i'm impressed by you but um we're gonna go ahead and take our second break of this episode when we come back we'll be talking more about that team that she assembled for illustrating and coloring etc you're tuned in to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back For the best and latest podcasts available anywhere, go to the podcast app on your cell phone and type in GSMC. 
to access free content-rich podcasts on health and wellness, book reviews, sports, entertainment, relationships, social media, movies, technology, finance, and even weird news. Subscribe and download the GSMC Podcast Network's family of shows. Available everywhere podcasts are found. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. As we head into this third segment, I do want to remind you that if you want to support the podcast in a monetary fashion, you can do so by going to gsmcpodcast.info. Again, that is gsmcpodcast.info. Again, again, thank you as always for every bit of support that you've given the podcast. Uh, anything that you do supports not only this podcast, but the network as a whole. As we get into a episode episode three segment three i um, we were talking before the break morgan was talking before the break about creating a graphic novel and finding the right team and everything that goes into that process and we're going to continue with that conversation now it's one thing to write a novel uh, but then to <laughs> have to find uh, all the other team members and hope that they can match your vision and because i would imagine even even if you can't draw i can't draw um <laughs> I would still have a, a definite idea of what I wanted characters to look like and what, you know, how that would look. So finding someone that you can work with that you're not going to just constantly butt heads with about about how things look would be a challenge. Right. And it's not even that. I fully I, I and I told them at the beginning, I fully accept that I don't know everything that there mm -hmm. is about your craft. So if there is something that you think, hey, this is not going to look good or I don't think that this works with this like let me know yeah. like oh I don't think that this is the transition that you think it's gonna look like once we get there like I want to know that because yeah. I want to make it so that you feel that like what you're putting out is the best you've ever seen because you've seen more than me yeah. guaranteed like this is your field you've seen more than me and yeah. um I felt like that sort of honesty and that sort of trust in your artist also kind of helped this collaboration as well True. and I have a whole discord channel of about like a year and a half's worth every day we're going back and forth talking about different things talking about color talking about like okay like I feel like this shade is off and I feel like we need to make sure that this continuation from page two matches what's happening on page like 86 yeah um, it's like that yeah, um, there's so much. I'm sure there's so much people don't even think about that goes into it. Um, what about the challenges of trying? Uh, you're the, as the writer, um, so you're one part of that whole the whole visual. But I would imagine there's some challenges in trying to write a graphic novel and getting like backstory to the reader, getting details to the reader because you don't have as much. You don't have as much word space to tell a backstory or so what were the challenges in in telling the story that you wanted to tell oh yeah I mean I'm a very wordy person just in general so it was it was really all about editing and sprinkling mm -hmm. and I didn't want to give all of the backstory away when I felt like down the road this would have been something that would have more of an impact so it's like what needs to be told now versus what can be told later mm -hmm. um and then I would write all of that down um in like, like a script form and I would then have like I would have pages printed out and I'd be like what is redundant what have I already said mm -hmm. what what doesn't need to be said what doesn't need to be said but could be said in a facial expression cross yeah. that out cross that out cross that out and then I would put little you know speech bubbles on my wall and then try to write in it myself and if it mm -hmm. got too big for what I felt like the speech bubble should be I was like okay I got to find a different way to say that give me a give me a list of synonyms <laughs> like find me something like I gotta I gotta make sure that everything fits um and I also think that with any sort of novel or graphic novel that, that spans more than one book I feel like 
mystery is very important and character layering is also very important. I feel like if I found out everything about the character in the beginning, why Right. would I read the end? Yeah. Why? Like, I'm, I'm just like wasting my time. And also with the fact, I think it also helped that I kind of had already drafted everything as a television show in my mind in the beginning that I had already kind of layered it out to where parts of the story were told in different episodes Sure. in my Okay. mind. And then I would make every episode into a book in my mind, willing on budget and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> willing on the budget. So, um, yeah, so I think kind of, I think that's how I went about making sure that the character had good pacing. And I also had other people read it too. And I was Mm like, okay, how do you feel? Like, do you feel like there's, do you want to read the next book? And if they didn't want to read the next book, it's like, okay, tell me why. -hmm. Right. Okay. And then it's like, okay, back to the drawing board. Like, how do we get someone interested in this? Um, Or how can I tell the story differently? Because I find the concept interesting. I need to be able to make other people feel what I see and what I feel. Mm hmm. So you really just jumped in with both feet, kind of baptism by fire. Now that you've got the one, the first one under your belt, what will you maybe do differently with the second one? You know, what have, what have you learned to streamline the process? I think what I've learned is that, you know, two people or, you know, a three person team is great, but I think that, you know, I could find more budget for another person just to make it easier and not so burdensome on some of my artists. Um, I also feel like now that I kind of know what to expect, the timeline, the certain budget, how many pages I can get with X amount, I know that, okay, hey, before I start doing this, I need to make sure that I have all this lined up. I need to make sure that the pipeline works very well. It's very, very smooth. Um, and then from there, I also feel like I need to also have like a promotion pipeline as well, because I, at that time, had no clue what to do after I even published the book. I was like, okay, I, I'm done. I did the first, I did the first book Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's out there and I have more in my mind. What do I do next? Um, and so I feel like that's not my forte when it comes to my own work. I, I always feel like, oh my gosh, like, okay, I'm done. I'm going to go take a nap. <laughs> um, yeah <laughs> that's valid <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think for like the next book and the next things to come, but that's very, very important. So, I mean, the great thing is that everything was already written out. I still have everything written out. Now it's just like, okay, like I, I have to work with coming up with a budget and funding it. And then I already have my artists in place, find someone else to help elevate the team to a different level for this new book. Cause I want the new book to have more pages and things like that. I mean, we've already started working on the character designs for the new characters that make their introduction in the book. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think there are still, the pipeline never stopped, but um, I think there's different ways that we can set it up to Yeah. make it more efficient. Without giving too much away, because you know you don't want to, you want people to read it. But what can you, what what can you tell uh, tell me about what's next for Celeste? What's next for Celeste is that she really has to hunker down and uh, kind of just like I kind of jumped into deep waters. She's about to jump into deep waters and, um, you know, kind of fight to survive. And it's going to be really fun. Um, it's, there's going to be drama, not even j not even just with her alone, but just in the school in general and through her family And um, I think it's going to be a fun ride. I think it's going to be an emotional ride, but I think it's going to be something that makes the reader grow and you'll see Celeste grow. Mm -hmm. Sure. If everything goes the way you want it to go um, and the arc goes the way you want it to go, how many books would you like to see in the series? I think there will be about 14 books, Okay. 14 books. If I get the page numbers that I would like it to be about 14 books. Okay. Um, 
And then why do you think, you know, you you were given a challenge. Um, what made you, this, this is, I would, would you, would you agree maybe middle grade, that age group for readers, uh, middle grade and older? Um, so what, what draws you to writing middle grade and sci-fi, a little bit of fantasy, but what, what about that draws you to write within it? Um, I think that that's kind of where I started to get my own kind of self-doubt was in middle school and high school a little bit. Um, I also think that that's kind of where people are seeking the unknown and that life kind of starts to really happen because that's kind of where you're you're growing up. You're being shielded and shielded. You're being shielded less um, than when you were a kid. And um, a lot of um, complicated things can happen during that time. And I think that, you know, I want a way for people to see that complications and be able to find a way around it or how to deal or how to cope with certain things. And so I think I, that's why I naturally gravitated towards that. Mm -hmm. Also, because I've just felt like there was just like, I don't know, something about high school and figuring that out and having it be placed there in a, in a boarding school just kind of really, that was something I really gravitated towards. And I thought, okay, like we, we really have something here. Yeah. High school is a bit of a, I don't want to say battleground, yeah. but it's definitely, <laughs> you know, it's, it's challenge in its own way. So it's a challenge. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Celeste is 14 and I, I don't want to be 14 and again, <laughs> but I, I know, don't want to be 14 either. <laughs> it's a good, I'm right there with you. It's a good age to, you know, start figuring those things out. And I can't quite imagine being Celeste and being thrown into something like this at 14. Um, I'm not sure I would have reacted well. <laughs> <laughs> so I can agree. Um, so you're working on the second one now. Is that correct? Is there a timeline? Um, we hope to be done with the second one about mid-2026. Okay. All right. Um when you think about this experience and again, jumping in with both feet, what advice would you give for somebody who's thinking, you know, I have an idea for a graphic novel? I mean, just go for it. Just go for it. I think I I go in with like if if no one else is going to do like I'm going to do this, no one else is going to take my idea and make it into something and do it for me. Like I got to do it myself and you won't know what your product will be until you finish the product. And I think that, you know, had I filled my head with self doubt, I would have, I would have froze. I wouldn't have completed it. Um, but I truly believe that I have been, I've been given this idea and I need to be a steward of that idea. I need to be the one that sees it out. Like I'm so excited for my characters and that passion kind of drives me to get it done. Um, and I feel like if that's something that drives you, like take that fire and put it to use. Yeah. And another thing I like uh, that I like about this series is, you know, they say if you if if you don't see the book that you want to read, then you should write it. Um, and I think the the representation in this book is really good because you don't often see young women of color in this type of role, especially in a graphic novel. I don't see a lot. And I think it's changing. But for young women to see themselves in books and and I think that's where your your illustrators did such an amazing job is there's so many different types of people portrayed within the school within the characters mm -hmm. um, I mean yeah that was also something that was just really really important part of Morganacity is bringing underrepresented stories to light and one of the things that I saw when I was a kid you know watching Totally Spies or Winks or something like that was, was that there weren't women of color, especially the black women, as like a magical character. And then mm -hmm. if they were, they were a side character. They yeah. weren't a main character. And I was like, well, that's kind of disappointing. Like, why can't we be main characters? Why don't we have interesting stories or, or interesting, you know, subplots that bring you in and that bring other people in? And with even with the other characters that are a part of Celeste's group, I feel like 
I've given them interesting subplots to go along with hers as well. Just because, like, just because you're not the main character doesn't mean that your story doesn't matter and doesn't mean that your story can't be interconnected with the main person's story and that you both can't grow from each other. Yeah. So I, I wanted everyone to grow with Celeste, but I also, I wanted that magical character moment. I Mm -hmm. wanted that cool costume transformation moment. Like, I wanted those cool devices, things like that. Like, I want that moment for Celeste. And I want it for myself and other kids. Yeah. Yeah. Because being 14 sucks. So I'll write <laughs> we, it. We, we all deserve <laughs> yeah. to think that something good can something happen. Something good that we can. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it cannot be said enough. Representation matters. But what I really love about this being a graphic novel is because, you know, we always say, everyone needs to be able to see themselves in the main characters or yeah especially the main characters of the books that they read right but in a graphic novel you really get to see yourself in the characters um young black girls get to see a strong character who is coming into her own who is learning of her power who is figuring things out and as i said at the beginning the illustrations are wonderful and um they really get to see someone that maybe looks like them represented in a way in a book that they are hopefully enjoying and um seeing you know we're not all going to be taken to a a off-planet boarding school where we discover powers we never knew but it tells us that we all have things inside of us that we maybe don't even realize are there and can we can hopefully take you know, I, I always wanted to be the characters that I read when I was growing up and to think, you know, I I can do hard things. And so to see yourself in books, I just, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm gushing because I love it. So fangirling a little bit. Uh, time for our last break of this episode. When we come back, uh, Morgan will be talking about what she likes to read. You are tuned in to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my conversation with Morgan Middleton. Before the break, we were talking about representation and Morgan was talking a little bit about what she hopes, um, not only for Celeste as a character, but also for her readers who are encountering Celeste and her adventures. So let's go ahead and um, return to the conclusion of this conversation with Morgan. When you take the time to read, just for you, um, what are some of your go-to authors and genres? Oh, I'm a period drama girly. I love my Jane Austen. I love my Elizabeth Glasgow. I mean, I period dramas and then like mysteries. I am right now reading The Psychic Eye. You know, I I, I kind of read everything and I feel like that kind of mirrors the way that I enjoy music and I participate in music. Mm -hmm. I listen to everything. Um, And so, I mean, as long as it it has a great premise, I'm I'm there. I'm down. Yeah. I just saw a TikTok today that they, that Netflix is going to do a a series based on Pride and Prejudice. And I uh, I saw that. I have such hope and such absolute terror at the same time. (laughs) I know. I know. I'm like, okay. 
Will I have a party for this? Yes. Will I enjoy it? We we shall we, see. We don't but know. Will I be there? Yes, I will absolutely be. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but will it be the will it be the 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 horror that people had over persuade the 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 recent adaptation oh, of persuasion? Yeah. Yeah. Um. I mean, it, I don't know. I mean, I'll watch it once, but we'll <laughs> see it, we'll see if I watch it. You know, a hundred times. I mean. I watched the 99, the 95 version of Pride and Prejudice so many times that my grandmother developed a British accent just by watching so much of it uh, and yeah. just quoting the entire thing. So we shall see. Time will tell. Yeah, that's a classic. I mean, just put that on Netflix and most of us will be happy. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, kind of an odd question, but opera is a is a very specific form of singing um so you know you learn different techniques how do you think being an opera singer maybe influenced how you write or do you think there's any correlation I mean I I think for opera singers we live for the drama so I know that we definitely want to see the drama in there um and I think that it has to deal with stamina Mm. A lot of it, like singing, there's a lot of stamina. The shows are very long. The productions can be very long. So um, there's a lot of stamina there. And I think that that stamina in, you know, singing and practicing and technique and things like that, I think that kind of can, you know, can kind of branch over to writing um, where I can just have a lot of stamina to write I don't know if that's a direct correlation but I like to think so mm -hmm. um but I feel like our ever-changing need to 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 move and to challenge the way that we sing and how we sing and how we project um there's always challenges in projecting since we're not using a live mic or anything like that and you know opera is trying to change the way that audiences see their productions and how people um, appreciate and kind of accept classical music into their lives and into their homes and things like that. And I think that as a writer with this new kind of resurgence of different stories, it kind of gets the juices flowing more because we're at a point where we're like, okay, how do we change and still keep the high art? Mm -hmm. And I think for writing, it's like, how do I keep the high art and tell my story how I would like to like it to be told? Um, and I think that that's something that carries over. Other than that, I just feel like it's just grit. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, crossing over that finish line and making sure that you get there in one piece, um, which I think you don't need to be an opera singer to do. You just have to be someone that's very, very determined. Yeah. Um... I'm sure. Um, yeah, I, I can only imagine the stamina that it takes to get through, <laughs> especially a main role, you know, where you have uh, the, the majority of the singing parts. Right, right. And it's just like, OK, I have how many more nights? Seven right. more nights? OK. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can't even uh, quite imagine how much you have to take care of your voice. So um, mm -hmm. um, favorite opera, favorite role that you've gotten to sing and Dream role. I know that's not about the book, but I am nosy. <laughs> Dream role is Dalila from um, Samson and Delilah. Mm. Uh, that's, that's like dream role all the way. Um, favorite role that I've sung entirely. Mm. I don't know, because it's really hard because there's the classical repertoire that I've done. And then there is the more modern contemporary that I've done and all the characters I love because I've made them my own. Um, I think I really liked Tituba and the Crucible. I think that was really, really fun. I got to mm -hmm. tap into like a darker aspect of myself um, and of the character um, and kind of bringing that to the audience was a lot of fun. And just like the way that it was directed was just incredible. Um, and then classically, I think I was one of the, <laughs> I was one of the sisters in Cendrillon, in Massenet Cendrillon, and I mean, just being like an evil stepsister is just fun, 
in general. Like that, that's just like that's just we're just playing around now. Like that and singing. I mean, it's serious, right. but it's. I mean, who who wouldn't enjoy that? Just being yes. a caricature, it's great. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I appreciate you <laughs> indulging me. Um, and if people want to know more about you and the series, um, the internet presence, so website and any social media they can find you on. Sure. So, um, morganacity.com. And then you can also find me on Instagram and on YouTube, um, at morganacity. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see, Morgan, we've talked about different things, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to make sure you highlighted during this time? I mean... I think I think one thing that I just want to also highlight in Asteria is that while we also focus on, you know, the kids, there's also a little bit of focus on her mom yeah. and what she has to kind of go through during this time of Celeste finding out who she is and how she reacts um, to her learning about this new world um, and her being placed into a school that she's already gone through. Um, and that she's revered at. And I think that that's also something that, you know, I, I find it really interesting and very honest with like a mother daughter portrayal. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk to me, not only about the series, but writing and opera. I really appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks for, uh, um, you know, inviting me to participate in my first podcast. So we, we actually talked about the fact that it was Morgan's first podcast before we started recording, and I completely forgot to mention it. So way more eloquent and self-possessed than I ever was in my f first podcast or my first, uh, the first time ever being in anything remotely like a podcast was a, a radio interview I did where I was only one of three people, and I think I said two things, and I sounded like a probably a blithering idiot. So Morgan, really good job. Thank you for <laughs> letting me be your first podcast. I feel honored. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much for, you know, coming on the podcast to talk about Asteria and the upcoming installments of the series. Uh, as I said in the interview, I really appreciate it. For you uh, readers out there who are fans of middle grade to young adult uh, science fiction slash fantasy. There's kind of a little bit of both in there. Um, science fiction because it's in space and there's some of that, but then there's still seemingly some magical elements that we're going to learn more about. So science fiction, fantasy, space, middle grade, young adult, graphic novel. If that's something that interests you, you should definitely check it out. If you have a young reader who might be interested in this, uh, definitely, definitely check this out because there's more coming. And I think graphic novels are a great way to get, um, if you have a reluctant reader, this is a great way to get them interested in books. And yes, graphic novels are books. They're still reading. You're still consuming content. You're still taking in a story. There's just other visual inputs and impetus, impetus. That's not the word I was looking for. There's visual inputs that are there along with the words. And I think it's a wonderful way, as I said, to get maybe sometimes reluctant readers to uh, hopefully fall in love with reading. And if you can encourage a reluctant reader, I think do it in any way possible. So definitely check out this book, uh, this graphic novel. And then when the next installment comes out, you we you can look forward to that. We can all look forward to that together, of course. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. I hope that you will join me uh, for the next ep next week's episode. I will be talking to two authors. Um, they go by Downing and Wa. You can see there they do have initials um, MM Downing and SJ Wa. But if you look at their website, uh, they do just go by Downing and Wa. And I don't think I'm pronouncing the second name correctly. I will clarify that next week. But we are sticking with middle grade, uh, not a graphic novel this time, but a series, The Adventures of the Flash Gang. Two books are already out. Uh, episode one, uh, Exploding Experiment, and episode two, Treasonous Tycoon. You know I love alliteration. This is this takes place during the Depression leading up to World War II 
in Philadelphia. You've got some really fun characters. I'm looking forward to learning more about the origins of this story and speaking with uh, the authors. So please join me for that episode as always. If you haven't done so already, please make sure you like, follow, subscribe. It uh, really does help get this podcast out to more readers, and it lets you know when there are new episodes whenever they come out. Also, if you leave a positive review, that is incredibly helpful. Don't forget to do that for your favorite books and authors as well. But leaving a positive review doesn't have to be complicated. It can be short and sweet and simple, but it really does help. The algorithm helps get this podcast out to more readers. If you want to follow the podcast on social media, you can do so on Facebook, X, Instagram, and TikTok. Love hearing from you. Come ask me questions. Tell me what you're reading, etc., etc. Indulge my nosiness, as I like to say. I hope you're having a great week and that week continues to go well. Whatever the week throws at you, though, I hope it gives you plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you so much. Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Damn, ain't that great. I don't wanna go. To